Okay, I think John's joining us here. Hello, John. Hello, how are you doing this morning? Who am I speaking to? Uh, my name's Dale Pinker, John. We were going to have an interview about a year ago, and you had some type of knee injury that I hope that you, or your arm, you had some type of injury last year, and we weren't able to pull it off, but the timing is great to have you here today, John. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice and to meet you. Why don't we Why don't we start with politics, John? Uh, okay. Are you the lib Are you the lib Are you the libertarian candidate for president in 2016? Well, I'm I'm certainly running for nomination, and and I don't I don't see any problem in in getting that nomination. Um, you know, we would. I prefer not to call this politics. You know, politics is is uh, a relatively new word in the world. It uh, it means the the quest for the acquisition of power within government and the retention of power within government. And I think that's what's wrong with government. Um, when when did government become uh, a seat of power? It started out as a seat of service. You know, George Washington had to be pushed, kicking and screaming. Uh, into that chair, you know, he had been a general in, in a great war. He didn't need to be sitting, you know, serving a couple of million people, um, and, and yet he did it. So, I think the last president to have done that was Dwight Eisenhower, you know, and an even greater general uh, with nuclear armaments at his command and battleships and and you name it. Uh, and he and didn't. Someone want that also, John, someone who warned us about where we would be today. 60 yes. years ago with the military industrial yes. complex how would John you know John we're I it's my belief we're drifting towards a scientific dictatorship with what's happening uh, with uh, the way government has control over uh, our privacy our civil liberties have uh, been diminished in the uh, justified by trying to protect us and instilling the fear of terrorism and every other fear uh, how would John McAfee make this transition away from a scientific dictatorship to uh, reinstalling the liberties that we had even 30, 40 years ago compared to now. Gosh, I'm really sorry you used that word scientific dictatorship because I am, my platform is based on, on technology as well as privacy and, and, uh, and liberty. Um, well, I would nominate you to I'm be the... Fine. I'm sorry? I would nominate you to be the cyber czar... <clears throat> For the United States of America, because warfare, although there's still bombs and jets and boots on the ground, is different in this era. And there could be more damage done through a cyber attack on all countries, vis a vis what just happened in Ukraine a month ago, where their power grid was interrupted. So, yeah. uh, do you, does that keep you up at night? Because I don't. I'm not a survivalist. I wouldn't do real well without the internet or electricity, buddy. Yeah, I'm. I'm not a survivalist either. I'm. I'm 72, 70 years old. I'm. I'm too old to live in a cave and and scrape wood for fuel. So uh, I would not do well. But you are correct. A, a cyber war would be far more devastating than the worst nuclear war imaginable. And this is what people do not understand. They go, well, a cyber war. So I'll be without the internet for a while. Well, no, you'll be without the Internet forever, but you'll also be without electricity and fuel and food because we do, people do not understand the interconnectedness of our industry through the Internet. Um, and if the Internet goes down, uh, the, the DEF CON, uh, some of my, my greatest friends are, are attendees of DEF CON or organizers of DEF CON. Uh, one of them, uh, one of the smartest gentlemen I know, uh, did a, a very in-depth study and said if the Internet goes down for two weeks, it will be an irreversible catastrophe and we will end up in one year in the Stone Age because our food delivery, our food production, our emergency services, our electrical grid are all controlled uh, and integrated through the Internet. Uh, and, and there is weaponized software in the possession of the Chinese and the Russians today that could bring down our uh, electrical infrastructure for good. By, sh by shuttling power to, to areas of the grid that simply cannot withstand it, frying those, then moving along and shuttling it in different places. Our grid is designed to do that. That's the problem. Uh, it's designed to do that because if we have an area of high demand, they move electricity from further away to, to satisfy that demand. Well, if you put the wrong software in there, and it's a piece of cake because our, our systems that control the electrical grid are old, 
antiquated, out of date, and vulnerable. If you put the wrong software in there that's controlled by someone else, like the Chinese or the Russians, we will end up with a burned out pile of rubble from which we cannot recover because our infrastructure will not exist to allow us to restructure it. So the preppers are getting ready for this and uh, I even <coughs> read when you talk about the power grid that we no longer manufacture our own power generators that they're all made in China so it would take six months even if they blew, blew a power station for us to be able to replace that so and, and the Chinese uh, are not going to be placed it. Uh, you know, let's let's you let's you use some wisdom here. Um, okay. The, the other problem is the Chinese manufacture virtually all of our routers, at least the firmware within the routers, uh, and it has been discovered that they have backdoors into that firmware. They control uh, all the lower levels of the internet, and we are completely unaware. Our government is like in in a dream world, and I think it's because our government has not bothered to re-educate themselves to the reality of this world. Um, I mean, we have congressmen who have been there for six terms and are, are expecting to be there for life. Uh, why do they need to retrain themselves? I spend six months a year retraining myself because the technological field is moving and changing and evolving so rapidly that if I did not do that, I would no longer be relevant. I mean, I'm assuming I still am relevant. That, that might be a false assumption itself. Uh, but the government does not do that for the, its technological employees. So uh, what would you recommend to a lot of the, let's say, you know, we're moving more radically to the right and left, uh, not only in the U.S., but across the globe. We have extreme right uh, uh, exemplified, personified by a guy like Donald Trump, extreme left personified by Bernie Sanders. Uh, what can we do to educate candidates, no matter who's president, I think that we're still in trouble because this has been built up over generations, our debt problems, our financial problems, and you, it seems to me like your worry is the Chinese, possibly Putin, so why do we continue to provoke the Chinese as they uh, continue to want to project their power, they want to be king, uh, we send naval ships and airplanes over those man-made built islands and a lot of people are worried about a hot war when you're saying it would only take uh, and no one would really be able to know where the attack came from to render us helpless and, well, and what could be done to prevent the Chinese or any adversaries of the current disorder that we have, but at least we have grocery shelves that are still stocked and we still have power and we still have the internet. What needs to be done to secure the United States against these potential? Here, here's, here's the problem we have. I think, I think if the Chinese want to be king, let them be king. It's a thankless job. Uh, we have been the world's policemen forever, forever. What, what has it gotten us? twenty trillion dollars in debt a government that has become so paranoid that its citizens are the suspect enemies I mean here's here's an example uh, the NSA says we need to look into your life because we're here to protect you and in order to protect you we have to examine all of your secrets to assure you that you are not the enemy we are protecting you from it's, I mean, this is the insanity of it. Uh, our privacies are invaded. Our freedoms are taken away. I mean, to simply travel, I have to stand in a line, take off my shoes, my belt, let them scrutinize my personal belongings, put my hands in the air perhaps and let someone pat me down to assure me that they're protecting me. I don't feel protected. I feel like the enemy. I feel like I'm entering a prison, which I have no small experience with in foreign countries. Yes, I, I was going to get to that. Uh, so in this environment, you know, John, people are considering, and I think about it, that rather be than being in the middle, uh, even if it's uh, we still have the internet, and but that cyber attack doesn't happen, and it's limited to a financial crisis or another banking crisis, and social security and disability checks and medical care not being able to be provided by the government. 
um, you having experience and not the greatest experience of being an expat in Belize, uh, where I would rather watch it on TV than be in, be in the middle of it, but uh, uh, is there really a place in the world that's going to be unscathed if some of these things we're talking about do manifest? Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe parts of Antarctica. Uh, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe learn Aleut and and live with the Aleutians uh, in the uh, uh, the northern ice and learn how to hunt whales. Um, I don't, you know, I, even though that's not a particularly uh, uh, nice thing to be doing, um, but li learn to live somewhere like that. But but really, it it, it will impact the entire globe. Uh, here's the problem: when when someone wants to be king, like America has been king, it doesn't call itself king of the world, but it sort of acts like it by sending its policemen to interfere in the relations of foreign states, the internal relations, in order to manifest some American interest. Now, we can't do that. I mean, first of all, it's morally unjust. Uh, it's economically not viable, uh, and, and it has created a drain on our society, both culturally and financially, that we, we simply cannot live with. I mean, I, I, I don't like what has happened to America. I'm 70. I was around when Dwight Eisenhower was president. And I don't care how plastic you want to call the 1950s, and, and they were, okay. Um, it was an era of hope and dreams. Yes. It was an era where all things were possible. Where a we, we, uh, we, lived the, we lived the majority of our life in the sweet spot, didn't we, John? We did, didn't we? We did. We had the, um, great, we had the greatest music. Uh, we, had, uh, uh, yes. we're, we were here for the greatest wave of economic expansion yes. in the history of mankind and right. now everything's coming home to roost and uh, you know I'm not a young able-bodied tough guy to uh, deal with what may be coming so what would you do to protect our country if you were the next president of the United States well the, the president controls the executive branch which fortunately controls the Department of Defense and all 14 covert government agencies. Uh, I would definitely uh, draw back the powers of those agencies and say, look, you know, the Department of Defense is designed to protect American citizens from foreign invasion, uh, not to protect American citizens from themselves. I mean, I don't need a mother and father, and I don't need a watchman. I don't need someone following me around and sniffing in my trash and and, and, and trying to get into the deepest secrets of my life. We, none of us need that stuff. Uh, it should be the reverse. We, as American citizens, should be able to spy on our government. We created it. It is there to serve us. So to have the government spy on us, to have the government keep secrets from us, is bizarre. We created it. It's a service organization. How do I know that you're serving me if you keep secrets from me? That's not going to stand. Now, I know there's all this, oh my God, you know, but if, the, if our enemies knew our secrets, then we would be vulnerable. What if we had no enemies? What if we stopped interfering in the internal affairs of foreign states? What enemies would we have? The only enemies we would have would be those who wanted to invade our borders so that they could use our natural resources. But if we had defenses for that, that would be foolish. So, you know, I, I'm not trying to be an isolationist, although... There may be nothing wrong with that in the, in the realities of today's world, but, but we cannot continue to police the world, interfere with the affairs of foreign nations for our own benefit. We have our own problems here in America. Good Lord, let's solve these. And that's going to take us decades. You know, after that, we can rethink our foreign policy. But until then, our ambassadors should be assigned to say, look, we hold you no ill will. We're not going to interfere in the internal affairs of your nation. I assure you that, in whatever, whatever diplomatic language is necessary to convey that intent, and stick to it, and stick to it. Okay, uh, definitely, uh, you know, it sounded to me like Ron Paul and Rand Paul, and uh, we really need, uh, we've spent blood and treasure to no avail in the Middle East. Uh, George Bush talked about the axis of evil, and he actually chose the wrong target. Uh, it was the easy target, Iraq, compared to North Korea, which <coughs> now is on the verge of uh, a yeah. possibly a hydrogen bomb, and, and right. Iran that now has a 
Their coffers filled with 150 billion, although they continue ballistic missile testing. I'd like to get into your bailiwick, though, John. Uh, one of the founders of Bitcoin has said that it's a failed experience. I never really a failed experiment. I need, never really got my head wrapped around Bitcoin because <laughs> if we have internet issues, what good is Bitcoin? What's your view on cryptocurrency? and the war on cash that's happening in our country. You talk about traveling. I've heard stories of people that have, you know, the legal limit of 10000 in cash to travel from country to country where that in Europe and certain other countries, that money is being confiscated because if you have that kind of cash on you when you're traveling, you're suspected of being a enemy of the state. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, okay, first of all, cryptocurrency. That was your first question. I, I did not say that cryptocurrency is a failed experience. No, it was uh, one of the founders. One of the founders. Well, I, said, his name. I, I, I think that founder got the phrase from me because, because I, I was the first to say it. And I, I'm not sure that it's failed. Uh, it can possibly revitalize itself. But here's the problem. Bitcoin has way too many problems. The first problem is people keep their wallets on devices which have open architectures like Android. Uh, Windows, Unix, and so on, uh, and then put protection around that, thinking that their wallets are protected. You cannot protect anything in an open architecture. I am the master of trying to do this. And of 50 years, because I've been in this business for 50 years, in 50 years, I have found no way to do that. It can't be done. Um, you, need, you need wallets to be on a secure hardware device which has to be provided by the cryptocurrency founders. You have to. Otherwise, we're going to... Because how many hundreds of millions of dollars have disappeared from Bitcoin wallets by users who did not understand uh, or by agencies that were offering secure services, etc., etc.? This is why Bitcoin cannot exist in its current state because people's wallets will just continue to be taken. It's like taking candy from a baby. Um, do you think there the are U.S. government, John, I just wanted to ask you, do you think the U.S. government allowed this experiment to go on? Because when you talk about control, there being no better control of people's financial life than the U.S. government uh, eliminating cash and having some type of credit debit system that could be a cryptocurrency? Well, you know, I, I don't think the U.S. government had much to do with it. I mean, <coughs> Bitcoin is a global phenomenon. Um, and there are, are, are many currencies, that, like there are currencies in South America, that, that have nothing to do with America, and, and you don't have to invade them to, to make them go away. Um, so I, I, I don't think the government allowed it. I think the government sat back and just kind of watched it with horror uh, because they were not controlling it. Um, but you, yeah, trust me, uh, it, it will come. A cryptocurrency will exist uh, that will be far more secure than Bitcoin and just as uh, anonymous um, and uh, the government is going to have no power. I think governments around the world are going to have to learn how to get by by not knowing where the money's flowing. Now that's going to be an, a, 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 an exorbitantly uh, um, painful task for governments, but it's coming. It is coming. And it cannot be stopped, I promise you. So I don't think the U.S. government allowed it. I think it just sat back and go, wow, that's something new. Um, uh, it did what it could, but what can it do? What can any government do? When the people collectively of the world decide to do something, well, who, who is the government? It is the representative of those people. And if the government decides to screw with it, and the people say, no, it's not going to happen, then the governments will go away and new ones will come. This has been, this has been shown over and over. Governments cannot, cannot regulate. They cannot legislate away a base human desire. I mean, prostitution, it's illegal almost everywhere. How long has it been with us? Well, since the beginning of time. Alcohol, I mean, look, look during Prohibition. Absolutely no alcohol. I think more alcohol was consumed during Prohibition uh, than since the Danes invented beer. So, Like the drug war, the unsuccessful the drug, drug war. The drug war. How many hundreds of thousands of lives has it cost us? How many trillions of dollars has it cost us? 
over the years. You legalize, and what you it, legalize what is it all drugs, John? You legalize everything to eliminate that part of the uh, black market economy, and so, uh, you, you have ahead. to you have to legalize the things which people insist on doing. I mean, you have to. Uh, if the overwhelming majority of people are drinking alcohol, you're not going to get rid of alcohol. I'm sorry, it will not happen. And believe me, the overwhelming majority of people are taking some kind of illegal drug, whether it's a pain medication they're getting from a neighbor, whether it's marijuana, whether it's even heroin. And let me tell you something, heroin, the addiction is its own punishment. We do not need to punish you more, as with almost all drugs. So if you want to go out and do heroin, well, be my guest, you know, because you will be punished. You will be. And it's not going to cost me anything to punish you. And it's not going to harm society to punish you. But if people want to do heroin, they will. They always, ever since heroin was invented, opium. I mean, opium has been outlawed. It was outlawed in China probably 10 different times all over the world. You can still get opium. You can get anything that you want. And so we have to accept that fact and stop trying to make laws to make it go away because laws do not stop anything. There are laws against bank robbery and theft. Do we still have theft and bank robbery? Of course. There are laws against almost everything. Laws are to provide a guideline for law-abiding citizens like you and I so that we don't go out and rob banks. But the ones that choose to do that are going to do that. It's a fact. So, so do you same know how many laws gun, you Same thing with gun control, John, right? Well, well you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very strong gun advocate. And on my table, I've got guns. I have a gun in my pocket now. Why? Because I live a very dangerous life. Uh, I do. You know, I lived, I lived in the most, uh, the murder capital of the world for five years, the least, where life is so cheap that for $10, you know, someone can remove somebody else if you're too lazy to get out of bed and do it yourself. Um, it, it's, it's a very crazy place. Um, and, and while I was there, I exposed a great deal of government uh, corruption. Uh, and it's my firm belief that the Belizean government is still out to get me. I carry guns. I think we have the right to protect ourselves from those elements of society that choose not to obey gun laws and go out and steal them uh, or buy them on the black market or smuggle them in from somewhere else. So yes, of course we have the right to bear arms. Now if you don't want to bear arms, you have that right too. Great point, John. So getting back to opium, let's talk about the Fed. <laughs> Cruz, not, all right, so let, let's talk about the Fed. Cruz wants to abolish the Fed. They've been around for 103 years, 102 years now. Uh, they provided the opium to the economy for the last several years. They've recently, in the last year, stopped providing as much, and we finally went, uh, Janet Yellen finally moved ahead with a uh, short and very minor interest rate increase and the markets are unraveling. Um, are you a believer that the Fed should be abolished as well? And uh, what would we, what, do we even need to replace it if it is abolished? Uh, the, 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 we don't need to worry about the Fed because it will, it will abolish itself when cryptocurrency becomes universal. That's a fact of life. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer that, that problems that are going to go away should be left alone. Uh, and let them just simply go away to, to, to die a natural death. It's, it's far less painful to our, our culture, to our economy, and to the, 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 uh, uh, the synergy and, and calmness of our society. Um, it, the same thing with Social Security. Uh, you know, we know that so, so, okay, here, here's the two largest areas of the U.S. government. One is the Department of Health and Human Services with a budget of $1.2 trillion. Next is Social Security with a budget of almost $800 billion. Now, the people, especially in the Libertarian Party, which I represent, say, well, it has to be abolished. Try doing that politically. That's insane. 25% of Americans are on it, and the other 75% are their children and grandchildren. And uh, the 25% who are on it are not going to vote for you, and neither are their children and grandchildren because they don't want to go, oh, my God, if, if, if mom loses her Social Security, she's going to have to move back in with us. Do you want that? No. So it's insane. It is utterly insane. However, what's wrong with saying, okay, uh, I did a talk a couple of weeks ago and I asked the audience for a show of hands. How many people 40 or under believe you will ever see a penny in Social Security? Everybody 40 or under had their hands raised saying, no, we're not going to get it. 
So why don't we start there? If you're 40, forget it. You're not going to get Social Security. We will, we will find some way, or you can find some way, to privatize this and save for your own retirement. For the rest of us, I'm sorry, for the next 50 years, we're going to have to pay Social Security somehow. We have to figure it out. It was a promise made, and people have structured their lives based upon this promise. You cannot break it. I wish you could, but you can't. We have to be political realists. But that problem will definitely go away if we say, okay, those who don't believe they're going to get it, and you've got to believe me if you're 40, nobody 40 believes they'll see a dime. What are we taking away from them? Nothing. So that's a very long-term solution and probably the longest solution that we, that we can face uh, in the current government. Others are shorter term. I think the Fed's going to be gone in 10 years. Cryptocurrency will simply make the Fed obsolete and irrelevant. They will disband themselves and go out and shine shoes or do what they do. Interesting, John. You know, it's really a, a fascinating environment. People are very worried about their 401ks. They've, they've been stung twice in 2000, stung in 2008. And here we are again on the precipice of uh, the worst start of a stock market in the history of the stock market. Um, do you think that we're headed towards this financial crisis? And is this financial crisis going to... Uh, a lot of people saying this could be the last bubble. What do you think life is going to be like in the next four years for the average U.S. citizen with what you see happening uh, in the cyber world, in the financial world, with, in, with social contracts, etc.? cetera? Um, what do you think that people need to do to prepare uh, for a potential crisis? Well, let's look at reality here. We have... We are $20 trillion in debt. The gross domestic product, the gross domestic product is about $4 trillion. Oh, no, I'm sorry, no, it's about $16 trillion. But the government of uh, budget every year is close to $4 trillion. Okay, so our debt is five times our, our government's budget. It's like you saying, okay, I make $50,000 a year. Uh, I'm a quarter of a million dollars in debt right now. Uh, my prospect for making any more money is getting slimmer because of, of dwindling tax revenues and, and chaos and uncertainty within my economy. However, I'm going to be healthy four years from now? No. No one's going to bet on that. You're not going to bet on it if it's your life. You know for a fact if you're a quarter of a million dollars in debt and you only make $50,000 a year, you're screwed. We are screwed. Let us get used to this. How are we going to come up with that $20 trillion? Manufacture it by printing more money? That would be the well, end of well, our There's only two ways. We either default on the debt or we hyperinflate out of it. Yeah, okay. Is there, so, a, third, is there, a, is there a third option? <coughs> no, there is not. And so that's the problem. So given those two options, one is going to have to happen. In either case, we're toast. Get real. Get used to it. Be honest. Use your own experience in life to try to see what's going to happen in the government, and you will see. We are screwed. Can I say that word on your program? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. So uh, if we are, John, and you, you had that uh, negative experience in Belize, uh, are you going to stand and ride this out here in the U.S., or do you think that there's a, a better place to be uh, than the U.S.? And if Trump does build a wall, is that wall to keep us in or to keep others out? Okay, well, the wall. Let's talk about the wall. What are the Mexicans best at? Building tunnels. I mean, good Lord, one, one man, El Chapo, in the highest security prison in Mexico, dropped through the, 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 the floor of his shower, which he had in his cell, which, which by itself seems odd to me. I've never seen an American prison with a, a shower in your cell. In any case, uh, hopped on a motorcycle, and drove it a mile underground in a tunnel where the water level was extremely high. Now you tell me what a wall is going to do. It's going to make, it's going to make those Mexicans who build tunnels very rich. They're going to be in high demand, and there are lots of them. So I do not understand the wall if it's to keep immigrants out, because those tunnels that are used to, to uh, smuggle drugs and things can be just as easily used to smuggle people. Very easy. 
No, line up about 10,000 this morning. We'll maybe, send the them wall, to tunnel in. maybe the wall Pardon? is to keep us in, John, working like cattle. Well, well, maybe, but you know, a, a smart man might find out where the exits of those tunnels are and just go the other way. I don't, I don't know, but I think it's a ridiculous idea. And he did say that the Chinese did it, therefore we can do it. Well, the, the Chinese, Chinese did it over many centuries. You know, they didn't build that wall overnight, um, and, it, and they didn't have tunneling back then like they have now. So I think it's a ridiculous idea, a huge waste of money, uh, and, and I do not understand it. This country was founded on the principle of open arms. Give us your poor, your dispossessed. That was our ancestors. Get real. That mine. was our ancestors. And that's we're why we're here. Yours, John. Where, uh, where's your ancestry from? Uh, mine's from Ireland and England. Um, okay. you know, my, from the Ireland side, I, I think the uh, uh, the first immigrants were were sheep stealers. They uh, they stole sheep, uh, got deported, and and ended up in in the mountains of Southwest Virginia in the Appalachians, uh, the poorest okay. area of, of America. I was raised in the poorest part of America, the Appalachian Mountains, and I want to tell you it is poor there. But but that's our ancestry, and because of that, we we tend to be very tough people. We tend to be resilient. Our our genes. Uh, you know, or uh, maybe don't go back to a perfect uh, uh, Snow White ancestry, but they're survivor genes. And, and so why not take in the poor, the dispossessed from other countries? Uh, give them a chance here. Good Lord, do you know how much space we have in this country? I'm an off-roader, and I've spent 30,000 miles in the past 25 years off-roading in the back roads of, of uh, Wyoming and Utah and Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, and and uh, Upper Nevada, good Lord, you can drive in America for an entire day and not see a house or a car and still see plenty of water. Now you tell me we don't have room for these people. We do. We do. John, talking about resonating, um, I wish you the best to spread your message, your libertarian message, uh, your John McAfee views uh, on what's happening in the current state of our country of what we need to get back to when people talk about old-fashioned values. I guess they need to read the Constitution, what our founding fathers had in mind, and how far we've drifted in our history of this. And I really want to thank you for taking the time. I wish you success in your campaign. I hope you get the nomination for the Libertarian you. Party. You have a uh, you know great name recognition, and uh, you're, uh, like they say, you're, you're one of the more interesting characters I've ever interviewed in my career, and uh, it's uh, been great meeting you, talking to you, and again, I want to thank you for joining us here on FX Street today. Thank you, Dale. Thank you very much, sir. And any time. And I'm sorry I missed the, the, the last one. I won't miss another. Thank it's you. great to have you, John. Thank you so much, thank and I uh, look forward to seeing more media exposure for John McAfee's bid to be the Libertarian candidate in 2016.